ESPN special only on Under Cover Capes. I'm sorry, start over. Okay, here <laughs> okay. we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hey, everybody, welcome to a new UCPN special. And I'm Al Mega, and I'm back, kiddo, after a short hiatus. Very happy to be back on air. And today I'm joined by my UCPN family member, Mr. Robert Swanson. What's going on, brother? Uh, living the dream, baby. Awesome. And talking about living the dream, I'm chilling today with one very awesome entrepreneur. I'm very excited to have him on. He has done things for fandom throughout a plethora of platforms. I'm talking about none other than Mr. Jeff Anderson. Hey, thank you so much for having me on the show. No, thank you for coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy is a beast. I mean, we're talking about the co-founder of Legion M over here, uh, Moby <laughs> TV, the New York Rock has changed. I mean, this guy has done it all. And doing everything, and he continues to rock on. I love it. I love this guy's energy. Uh, <laughs> with that said, Bobo, the floor is yours. Awesome. So I know you guys just got done wrapping up all the fun stuff with Sundance and that awesome Stan Lee show. Um, I want to kind of paint a picture. I want to take it back. Um, going through all my history, looking up everything about you, how does a guy – who goes to UCLA, if I'm not mistaken, and gets yeah. a degree in man- mechanical engineering, end up yep. on the path that you end up on? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and I don't know that I've got a great answer for it, other than I've got maybe a short attention span. And I have uh, um, I feel like I'm in my fourth career right now. I was, uh, as you mentioned, I was a mechanical engineering major in college. My first job, believe it or not, was designing theme park rides. Uh, I worked for a company uh, that produced show action equipment and special effects. And so um, my first job out of college was working on Jurassic Park, the ride uh, at Universal Studios Hollywood. Um, Oh, wow. Which was actually a killer gig. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, so I, I did that. And then I worked in the toy industry for a while designing toys. Uh, and then I got pulled into a startup company around 1999 um, and was he- very heavy in the tech side. Uh, that, that was the company Moby TV. We were the first ones in the world to launch live television on cell phones, nice. um, you know, back in 2003. I don't know how old you guys are, but if you remember, like, the, the, the early flip phones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh God. I, I, listen, I've been around since we were carrying beepers that were the size of VCRs, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. So, uh, um, so yeah, so in the Motorola Razor days, you know, mm-hmm. we launched TV on a, on a cell phone and that got me a little bit into uh, entertainment, but more into technology and, you know, kind of the whole Silicon Valley entrepreneur culture and, um, you know, disrupting kind of major industries. It's, it's really fascinating kind of case study. I mean, like I said, we launched live television on a cell phone back in 2003, and it's funny because today that doesn't seem like such a weird thing. But back in 2003, the only place that you watched television was on a television. Yes. Um, streaming wasn't even a thing. Like you didn't mm-hmm. stream on your computer. Um, you didn't watch, obviously, on mobile devices. I mean, th- these were on some of the very first mobile devices. Uh, it, it was hard enough to had- download a picture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. In fact, we we were coming online the same time that cameras were coming online, and both of us got the same pushback. Half the people would go, "That's the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. Why do I need a camera on my phone? Right. Well, who would ever watch <laughs> television on a cell phone?" And it, it's funny, like yeah, like everybody felt that way. We had some of the biggest people in Hollywood tell us. That is stupid. Nobody's ever going to watch movies on wow. their phone, and we got kind of laughed out of uh, laughed out of a lot of offices. But uh, you know, a couple of years later, we ended up winning an Emmy Award for innovation in television. And I think that today <laughs> the joke is definitely on those guys. So, <laughs> as Bobo mentioned, I mean, you know, you, you go ahead and go for mechanical engineering. Did you ever expect to win an Emmy? <laughs> Yeah, no, not at all. Definitely not expecting to be a, a 
you know, Sundance Film Festival and, and um, doing all the amazing things that we've been doing with Legion M. But it's, it's, it's really, you know, for me, like I said, I, I always relish kind of doing new things. And um, well, I think what Moby TV taught me, that was my first startup company that I was involved with. Okay. And I think what's really interesting is if you, you know, startups are oftentimes it's about disruption and, mm-hmm. A, a lot of the things that you learn running a startup really apply to almost any startup. It doesn't matter whether you're Uber trying to disrupt the taxi cab industry or, you know, Facebook who, you know, created a whole new paradigm for communications, mm-hmm. but it's, it's kind of the, the mentality and the mindset that you have once you kind of get involved with the startup. And I was fortunate enough to, you know, to be involved with a startup that was very successful and got to see kind of the whole life cycle. Um, Those lessons apply. And so now Paul and I are back. Um, Paul was one of my other co-founders. We're three of us at Moby. Um, But, uh, and we're doing the same thing with the entertainment industry. And, and it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's very similar. So it's, it's probably more similar, even though the industries are radically different. It's, 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 there's more similarities than there are differences. I totally agree. And with that, you know, since you're doing so much, you know, within the entertainment industry, let's talk a bit about your personal fandoms. I mean, what what was your fandom growing up? What what was the stuff that you enjoyed watching and or reading? So my holy trinity growing up would have been Star Wars. Mm. Um, I mean, I came out, uh, Star Wars came out the very first one. I was a little young uh, for it, but my parents took me to see it. And then like when Jedi came out, my parents literally took me out of school. I missed the day of school so I could <laughs> nice. go see it. Uh, which cool I parents. thought was the coolest thing <laughs> <laughs> ever. Yeah, no, I got to thank my parents for that one. Uh, so definitely Star Wars. Um, the second would be Lord of the Rings. Uh, I read, I got those probably when I was in junior high school or maybe a little bit younger. And I probably read them three or four times. I mean, wow. the whole, uh, the Hobbit and the trilogy, it, it kind of stopped there. I never got into the, the Cimmerillan or mm-hmm. I can never even pronounce the name, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and then the third one, uh, would be Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So, uh, <laughs> put those three, three things in a pot, shake them up and you end up with me. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Bob, would you got anything there? Are you awfully quiet? Bobo, you with us? I think Bobo got his oh, mic off. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, um, no, I was, I was saying, I was just listening to the man talk. Um, so, I have a question about your Star Wars side, um, Jeff. Um, what, what drew you into that series as a kid? Do you think was it the characters? Was it the story was it the effects i mean or was it everything in between hello did i lose him oh i'm sorry no i'm sorry about that i put myself on mute <laughs> oh um <laughs> is that um uh, is it okay to continue yes yes absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. okay good yeah so um uh, yeah, if I, it's a great question. And I mean, it was really the whole thing. I'd say if I had to choose one element above any other, there would probably be two. Uh, one would be Princess Leia, uh, just because I was completely smitten with her. <laughs> um, as a, you know, as a, a elementary school boy, I was crushing hard on her. But uh, uh, I think the other one, you know, probably even more importantly was the story. I've always felt that uh, story is so essential for me and in my enjoyment of film and and entertainment. And I know that there's a lot of people like that's not a universal quality. I mean, a lot of people really like, you know, depth of character or dialogue uh, or something like that. And, you know, you look at films like, you know, Manchester by the Sea, uh, which was an amazing film. But mm-hmm. for me, I would take, you know, Star Wars or, you know, Starship Trooper or just any crazy thing. Like I can, I can get past a lot of inferior acting and effects and kitsch. And like, I can deal with all that sort of stuff as long as there's like a really strong story compelling it forward. 
You said Starship Troopers. I I, I love that cheesy movie. <laughs> I love that movie. I, I love you know, it. It's, <laughs> it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure. It but is. It's just, um, I haven't, and I haven't seen it in a while, but uh, yeah. That's, that's, I that's saw it in the movie theater. I see it, I stop and watch. Yeah. yeah, I saw it too. And I'm proud of that, man. Yeah, I, I love that. Man. Rico, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> awesome stuff. Uh, all right, so there's another thing that I, I actually saw here. <laughs> You're an interesting dude, man. Let me tell you, an amateur auto racer. <laughs> yeah, wow, you guys dug deep on your research. <laughs> I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> I'm I'm what, pretty impressed. What's yeah. going on there, man? And, and, and if so, what's the hardest car you have driven? <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's gonna make you uh uh i think that's a good way to kind of establish like what level of auto racer i am right. the hottest car that i've ever raced is a mazda miata um oh. like a 1990s <laughs> a 1990s okay. era mazda miata and uh um, I've been into auto racing my whole life. My dad, when I was growing up, was a uh, photographer, and he would um, oh, shoot cool. at the racetrack. Like, he'd shoot people's cars on mm -hmm. commission. Um, mm -hmm. And so I grew up at the racetrack for a lot of my formative years. And uh, when I got to be old enough, I was able to go to driving school and, um, you know, it kind of dabbled in auto racing. And uh, it's a hard hobby to dabble in because it's very expensive and it, it can uh, um, at any given time you can end up leaving your entire investment which is your car like out on the track because you crash and yeah. uh, um, I've crashed many times and uh, <laughs> you know but <laughs> fortunately nothing nothing ever serious but it's it's definitely um, you know the funnest thing uh, one of the funnest things I've ever done in my life I can't imagine. I'm jealous. I would definitely want to try that. I, I definitely want to hit it. Home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you know I'll crash. I got to tell you. <laughs> yeah, if you ever get a chance, you can do a track day. You know, a lot of times they have these, and it's, it, they can be a little hard to find because they're not kind of mainstream. But you mm -hmm. know, if you if you do a little Google searching, you know, there's a there's a racetrack near you, and there's probably a day where you can spend a hundred bucks or 150 bucks and either take your car out on the track and, you know, for all levels, like they'll do it with a coach in the car, you know, and, and in ways that are completely safe. Um, the only thing I'll say is, you know, it's, it's completely safe. Like you're not going to crash on one of those days, but the real danger is that you're going to get hooked uh, <laughs> and oh, you're going to find yourself going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Ain't that always a thing? Because I was very addicted to paintball back in the day. Oh, my God. Oh, I needed yeah. to do this every week, and I had an auto cocker and a Tipman 98. Wow. And, and I was rocking yeah. people in my JT, Dogs of the AMS jersey. <laughs> it was fun <laughs> stuff. That's we were so awesome. we that were sounds like a lot of fun. It was. We were total amateurs, and there was a professional team there, and we just happened to go there to just, you know, practice amongst ourselves but the guys you know looked at us and said, hey let's teach you a few things they said <laughs> we wound up cleaning their clock in less than five minutes you know we did it brooklyn wow. style we, we did it brooklyn <laughs> style impressive. on them oh yeah these guys got <laughs> so mad they're like you guys are pros you guys are, are liars so the, the after that we, we just nicknamed them team that was then. Uh, <laughs> they were not That's very funny. happy. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Have you not paintballed since you're a man of adventure? I okay. never have. I've always wanted to. And, um, yeah, I've always wanted to. And, and uh, it's funny because, like, I'm at an age now. Like, I'm in my mid-40s, and I love video games. And, okay. you know, but it's like – if I try and play like a first person shooter, like I just, you know, like I, I, I can't keep up right with my kids. And so now oh, I'm like, I, oh, I want to get out on a real paintball course or a real paintball park. Let me teach you I something, kiddo. You're, you're yeah, not going to exactly. camp here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's Listen, right. It, it's always a good soaker. And then there's always co good cold pizza over there. Cause as we know, that's one of your faves. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You're actually in good company with that because both Al and myself are very much all about the cold pizza. <laughs> you know what? It's just something about it when it's cold. It is. It's. You are absolutely right. I can't describe it myself either. It's just 
It's cold pizza. It tastes good. I was explaining to my wife, you know, uh, explaining to Bobo about it, that my wife totally does not understand why I have to eat it cold. <laughs> like, it tastes better. It's just bread and cheese. Come on, lady. Stop it. You know? That's right. All right. I have another question for you. I was to see that. One of your other weaknesses in life is board games. Mm-hmm. What is your go-to a- board game? Oh, uh, Settlers of Catan. No question at all. <laughs> So you would clean anyone's clock in that game? I'm not saying that I would clean anyone's <laughs> clock, but I think that I'm pretty competitive in that You're game. You're formidable. I just, <laughs> yes, yes, I'm a formidable opponent. And um, I just think, like, I'm, I'm a little bit of a student of, of board games. Like, I've done some board game design, nothing, I mean, just, you know, amateur, like me and my friends playing around. But um, I enjoy kind of studying the game mechanics. And I love that game because I think it's such a wonderful combination of, um, you know, strategy. Um, It's got, you know, the luck element, which is Mm -hmm. very similar to like craps, uh, which is another game that I love. Um, But it also has the social component with the trading. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've I've spent many, many... (laughs) And I'm <laughs> staying up way too late uh, with my friends playing Settlers of Catan, and I think it's I think it's one of the best. Oh man, I can't imagine it. It, it sounds like total fun. <laughs> that it does. Baba, what's your board game of choice? <laughs> I'm not as complex as people. I've been <laughs> uh, um, I've been compared to Satan when I play Monopoly. Oh, okay. Some some girl in college was like. <laughs> And I, 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 I was like, okay, I guess I'm Satan now. Like, you must um, have been a bad landlord, boy. No, I would make deals with people because I knew I would get the money eventually. Mm. Like, ah. they, they would get to a point where I'd start making concessions. Well, just give me that property and oh. uh, a hundred bucks <laughs> there. When you come back I around, gotcha. we'll square up. I was, it was basic. Lo- you know, I was, I was a loan shark <laughs> on a board game. That's basically wow. what I was. <laughs> that that really kind of tells you something. I mean, you know, if you were cut from that cloth, you know, have you tried loan sharking in the real world? I mean, it sounds no, like I, a, I, natural, <laughs> a natural aptitude. I don't, I don't think I want to get involved with loan sharking. To be quite honest with you, you know what? That'll give your Twitter handle Bobble F and Mac a whole new meaning. <laughs> oh God! Oh, I don't, I don't need that type of publicity. Um, I, I, I did have a question for you before we uh, move on to Legion. What did you do at Hasbro? I, I'm a toy guy. I love my action oh, figures. Great. So yep. I, I do toy photography and toy reviews. Um, what was it that you did at Hasbro exactly? So at Hasbro, I was at a division called um, Cap Candy. Uh, and I did almost exclusively spin pops. I don't know if you're familiar with spin pops or if you remember spin pops from, I do. uh, they were kind of, uh, a big thing. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a funny story. So, uh, you know, if you're anybody listening, if you're not familiar with the spin pop, it's basically a handle with a motor in it that spins a lollipop. And <laughs> it started out, it was a total gimmick toy. Um, you know, it's like, oh, hey, look, you just push the button and the lollipop spins, so you don't have to, I don't know, wear out your tongue <laughs> licking it. You know, it's just, it was a fun, you know, and it's the sort of thing they would put on the impulse aisle, and it costs four ninety nine, and it's right next to the cash register, and and um, it sold like crazy. So what they soon realized is, oh, well, wait a second, if you put a spinning lollipop and you you, um, you know, slap like a Rugrats logo on it. Now you've got a Rugrats spinning lollipop oh, yeah. and that makes it, that makes you sell even more. And then it got even a little bit more evolved and they realized that, well, you've already got batteries and a motor to, <laughs> um, uh, to make it spin. And so it doesn't cost that much more to have like basically animatronic motion. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, maybe you've got um, uh, a Rugrats character and as the motor spinning, it turns a cam that makes the mouth open and shut. And so um, it was really kind of a fun gig. I mean, it's a total throwaway toy. Like, you know, I don't even know if they still exist anymore. But uh, I'm actually looking um, them up. They kind of do still sell them 
as a collectible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I think a lot of people grew up, but, but like I said, they just kind of got more and more sophisticated. So the crowning achievement, I would say, of my time at Hasbro was the SpongeBob SquarePants Spin Pop. And so, you know, you can Google that and you'll probably see a, an image of it, but it's SpongeBob standing on a surfboard. And I worked out this really elaborate cam motion. This was where my um, mechanical engineering and my theme park experience paid off because I was able to build this thing so that his arms moved and the surfboard bobbed up and down. And like once every second, his pants would fall down, right? You know, so that you could see his, uh, you could see his underwear and then they, and then they'd pop right back up. And so it was, uh, um, you know, it's again, it's a silly little toy, but for me, it was the, the, the technological marvel and the, the pinnacle of probably my engineering experience. <laughs> awesome. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Right, yeah, so no problem. So let's Thank go. you for asking. I don't get to talk about sponge. Or, or, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm yakking all day about I'll leave you out, but uh, I, I don't get to talk about auto racing and SpongeBob SquarePants very often. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm happy we're, we're able to, to have you do that. I mean, th that's what we're about. We, we got to know the person behind all this stuff, man. I mean, you know, what? You know, I myself, you know, as a CEO of my comic crusaders on the cover case, man, you know, I hardly get to enjoy the stuff that I do, but when I do, I like, I want to talk about it, you know? And, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I, I get you 100, man. You know, sometimes you got to sit back, relax and enjoy the stuff that you do. I mean, just like the other day with the Legion M, you, you had the, uh, or the Kevin Smith announcement, right? With the clerks and yep. you, you've been doing the Stan yep. Lee stuff. I mean, how is it to be involved in all of that? It's, it's it's very exciting and uh you know legion m is it's a startup company and so um startup companies they, it's just in it, there's nothing quite like it you know you talk about a theme park ride like there's there's no roller coaster like a startup company because um you know you, you never have that much money you never have enough nearly enough money hmm. to do all the things that you want to do mm. and uh, it's tough because, you know, they're one day, the, the highs are incredible. And, yes. you know, on Wednesday, we had a tribute for a thousand people with a thousand people to celebrate the life of Stan Lee in the Chinese theater. And, you know, Wesley Snipes was there. And Lawrence Fishburne was there. And Kevin Smith was moderating. Mm. Mark, Mark Hamill was there. And I was, you know, we were standing on the red carpet, you know, and Matthew Modine wants to come up and talk to us. Oh and, and, you know, we got interviewed by CNN and it's, it's oh incredible. And you're just like, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, this is uh, uh, amazing. And, then, you know, the next day there's some problem that comes up and you're like, oh, my God, we're all going to die. <laughs> <And> that's, <laughs> that's kind of the startup life. And so oh, it is. It's it's exhilarating and it's it's it can be addicting and it's it, it can be a grind and but it's at the a end journey. Of the day, this is it is and at the end of the day there's there's nothing that I'd rather be doing just because um, at least for me uh, it, it, if you can stomach the ups and downs the feeling of being a small team that's taking on the world um, that's facing long odds um, and succeeding or you know making traction against them. Uh, there's nothing quite like that, and, and I absolutely, I absolutely love it. See, that's a question I have for you then, because I'm a team builder, right? So, how did you come about building your team? What are the things that you look for in people? You know, that, that you want to work directly with, whether it be with Legion M or any of your other entrepreneurial efforts. That's a great question, and the answer is that uh, the, the team is really the most important thing mm -hmm. at a startup. I mean, when you mm -hmm. invest in a startup or when you're looking at a startup, um, uh, some people make the mistake of, of kind of saying like, oh, like, well, that's, that's a dumb idea or, oh, my God, that's a great idea. Um, the fact is the idea is far less important than the people that are on the team because the idea is going to change. I guarantee it. It's going to change. And the, your startup is going to change. The challenges completely, you know, when you're uh, a two or three person company working out of somebody's garage or spare room or something like that, the challenges are 1 million percent different than when you're a hundred to 200 person company 
that's working to expand. And the challenges you face are different, and your market is, is different, your customers are different. The idea is fluid and is going to evolve, but the people – You've got to get the right people on the bus. And that's the way that, 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 that you got to think about it, is what are the people that I want on my team, you know, knowing that we're, you know, we're, we're on this boat, we're going down this river, there's going to be rapids, there's going to be twists, there's going to be turns. Who are the people that are going to give us the best chance of, of survival and, and of succeeding? And so um, it really all just comes down to finding people that are talented, um, people that you trust, and one of the things that I think we learned from our first, uh, our early startup is mm -hmm. you, you need people that you respect and that you want to work with. Um, you know, there's a lot of very talented people out there that are very difficult to work with. But at Legion M, like we've just learned, like, you know, we have a strict no asshole policy. <laughs> and so if, if, if you're not somebody that I want to go to lunch with, there's no way that you're going to be part of our team because Understood. we're going to, you know, life is too short and the creating right. the, the culture and the team dynamic is, like I said, in my opinion, is far more important than the idea. You can have the best idea in the world, um, but it's not going to get anywhere unless you got the right team behind it. But how, how would you handle a situation where maybe, you know, a, 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 an asshole has crept in <laughs> like a snake? And, and, you know, yeah. and, and over time, you see this negative atmosphere that this person may be creating. How do you handle something like that? You know, it, it's really tough, and especially in a startup, because in a startup, it's really more like a family mm -hmm. than it is a company. And right. people are really close. And when you get to a point, they, again, startups are always changing their needs are changing, um, and people are always changing. Uh, and so when you get to a point where it's no longer a good fit, it's literally probably one of the most difficult things to do because it's, you know, it's almost like getting a divorce or something like that. Like, it's not like, okay, hey, you know, it's not an easy, easy thing. Um, it's a little bit easier if the person's a jerk, uh, just because yeah. then, you know, it, 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 then, then if it's somebody who's really nice that you don't want to let go, yeah. but just for whatever reason, uh, like I said, the needs of the company have changed and you no longer need them. And mm -hmm. I mean, you're a startup, so you can't afford to have like people that you, just because you like them. Um, yeah. so, you know, I, I think the one lesson that I've learned and I've heard this repeatedly from successful entrepreneurs is it's like a band-aid you, you just you, you got to do it and you got to do it soon um one of the one of the biggest mistakes that that companies make is allowing those situations to persist for too long gotcha. um because like you said the wrong sort of person it can be like a cancer and it can just kill a culture mm -hmm. uh it can taint a culture it can change things it can drive the good people that you want on the bus away um and so Every successful executive that I've talked about, if you, if you talk to them about what was the biggest mistake that they made, a lot of them say, I, I should have let this person go earlier. Um, just it's like I said, it's hard, but you gotta, <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta rip off the band aid and, and, and then go from there. And I mean, frankly, it's, 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 it's good for them too, right? It doesn't help anybody to be in a situation that's not working. Um, Absolutely. because you know, you're holding them back from their career and they're holding your company back, uh, from achieving its direct. And so you just gotta, you gotta address it. And that's something I see that uh, that I've looked up as well. That uh, as one of your arch rivals, uh, you know, I, I want to elaborate a, a little bit on this. <laughs> one of your arch rivals is rules without reasons. Yep. Want to elaborate yeah, a little bit on that? A, yeah, I mean that's a very entrepreneurial sort of mindset. In that, I think all great entrepreneurs recognize that you know or at least have the feeling that, you know, not all rules are that important, mm -hmm. right? You know, like some rules need to be broken. And it's, um, I think for me, there's an understanding of like doing things that are moral versus immoral or right versus wrong and doing things that are within the rules or against the rules. And so, you know, for me, like, you know, obviously you don't want to do things that are wrong. You don't want to do things that are immoral. But a lot of times rules are set up 
And there's really no reason for that rule, or maybe the rule didn't contemplate the situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in those cases, like there's times where we, you know, consciously say, like, I, I know that this is what the rule is, but that's actually in not the right answer in this case. And so, you know, for me, it's an annoyance. And when it's, things that you have to follow the rules because like those are the rules and it's, you know, it's the U S government or it's the IRS or the SEC, you really don't have a choice and, yeah. and you've got to abide by them. But, you know, frankly, what makes entrepreneurs successful a lot of times is recognizing that, you know, this is, this is the rules. This is the way things are, but it's not, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and maybe there's a way to change it and, and, and then working to find a way to change it. Awesome. See, one of the other arch rivals is conference calls, and having you on a podcast with three people feels like one. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is a very cool conference call. This is oh. <laughs> this is a con this is more of a party line than a conference call. <laughs> well, for people that don't know what a party line is, you used to call a nine hundred number. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh god, do those still exist? I don't. I have no uh -uh. idea. Well, I mean, now it's just like FaceTime. It's like a group chat, you know. I, I'm, I, I doubt the 900 number still exists I, for a party line. I think Baba was about to admit to something, and we cut him short. <laughs> yeah, no, I was thinking about those commercials like at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm like, I've been up too late. I'm like, yeah. oh, God. And I, I, I don't think those are 1-900 numbers anymore. I think they're just like a local number specific to that market now. It's a text. Because they yeah. all do it like. Uh, with the digital phone calls, but I'm uh, why am I talking about this? I'm not an expert. <laughs> I don't know. You, you seem to have a lot of information on the subject. Those, those late nights. <laughs> Apparently, I do without even realizing it. Those, those late nights. We're learning movies. a lot about you. Uh, I, apparently, right? Apparently, he's uh, sidelining as a loan shark, and he, he spends a lot of time calling uh, one one nine hundred numbers. And, uh, <laughs> like, when do you have time to do toy reviews when you're doing all that, bro? Well, I'll tell you, it's a, it's a very risky uh, balance. I live in. I live life on the edge. <laughs> I don't awesome. drink diet soda. Ooh. Uh oh. <laughs> so, so um, question: Are you are you a comic book fan at all? You know what? Um, I mean, not not a large one. I I I love movies and I love books and I actually love comic books. Like I love to flip through them and I love the artwork and I love it as a medium. Um, but I'm not a comic book guy in that, you know, I, like, I didn't grow up going okay. to comic book stores. It, it, it just, it, it, it wasn't a part of my life. I, I could change I'm more that. I'm like a later life fan. Uh, I yeah. could definitely change the question then. So being that you're a movie fan, then who's your go-to movie superhero person, whether male or female, Oh, you know, that, that your go-to tough person in movies. My gosh, that's, that's a big question, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I We've gotta say, I think, I mean, I love Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, if I had to choose like one individual superhero, um, it would definitely be somebody out of the Marvel Universe, just because I'm such an enormous Stan Lee fan. And I think it would probably have to be Spider-Man, just because I know how important that character was for Stan um, and 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 for, for those reasons. But I mean, to be perfectly honest, like I... I love them all. Like there's, there's very few uh, comic movies that I haven't seen. And there's even fewer that I haven't enjoyed because gotcha. um, like I said, I love a good story. So and you're telling uh, me there's you so even, many fascinating characters. You even enjoyed those old school eighties ones where Dolph Lundgren was the Punisher. And <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my God. And the Roger Corman F4. Still my Superman. I mean, Agreed for there. sure. Christopher Reeves is, and I mean, honestly, like, you know, I'd almost go back and say that, you know, Michael Keaton is kind of my Batman, because like when I was growing up, like that's who Batman was. And it's kind of yep. funny how it how it changes. But we're the uh, same age. Um, I, you're preaching to the that? choir. We, you are preaching that's to the choir. Right. We're the same age. I saw Batman that's in the right. movie theaters, too, in Brooklyn. And, and as soon as the movie finished, somebody decided to throw bottle rockets off in the theater. What a great time. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's crazy. That's, that's crazy. No, I mean, never do I can objectively today. say that that the the newer Batman movies are way better. 
you know, the okay. whole Batman, uh, Batman Begins, the Christopher Nolan series. Like those are my favorite Batman movies by far. But again, if I, if you ask me who Batman was, I, I, I'd, I'd have to say Michael Keaton for better or worse. Okay, Bobo, we gotta throw in this loaded question since this has been one of the biggest chats uh, across the Twitterverse recently. Who would you like to see cast as the next Batman? Oh gosh. <laughs> wow. I don't know. You know, I, I guess I haven't been following it. Are, are, are there candidates? Are there people that, that people are talking about? Well, the, the, it's the, still the, speculation. The WB speculation. has an official yeah. announcement yet. Josh Ham is, is, is the one that everybody seems to like. But my wife has shown me. Babe. Babe. Where was the gentleman from the show that you said would make a good Batman? Which witches of East End? There's an actor, an act, <laughs> witches of East End. Let me say that right now. There's an actor there apparently that my wife she forgets his name, but Danny DeMasio. Danny DeMasio? There you go. Something. Mm, Sorry if I, I put to the I, name. But, yeah, it's not ringing a bell. She for likes me. him um, as a potential Bruce Wayne Batman, uh, but people are saying Josh John Hamm. Hamm? Yeah, Mr. Ham. Josh Ham or John Ham, whatever his name is. John Ham. John Ham. John Ham. John Ham. Wow, on. I would not think of him. Like, I mean, I guess physically, I just it's funny because I think of John Ham as more of a comedic actor because I yeah. love so many of his. Of yeah, his but look at Paul Rudd, roles. for example, doing Ant Man. I didn't think you know because he does That's funny true. type movies, but he, he's an awesome Ant Man. <laughs> It, oh, he is. But again, like I feel like the the tone of the Ant Man movies is more of a comedy yeah, than I, Batman. Yeah. Like I I couldn't imagine a comedy about Batman. You know, <laughs> although it's funny because like you know the original series, the television series Adam was very West. lighthearted. Yeah, yeah, and zany and silly and all that sort of stuff. So I don't know. Maybe it's just maybe it's maybe that's what the world needs is kind of the. The reimagining of Batman that's not this dark, brooding, yeah, serious, a little bit more you know, lighthearted. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. Tad. Maybe a little bit more fun. Just well, a it's tad. so interesting because, like, <laughs> I feel like superhero movies kind of started off as a genre, um, but then once they became all-consuming, and like it seems like half of the tentpole movies coming out are superhero movies. It's Marvel. Um, Marvel's, like, Marvel's initiative well, in, in, in well, making this cohesive Marvel, universe. It, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and but I mean, DC is, is falling suit. And it's like, um, I think what's interesting, though, is how you see the superhero genre kind of splitting into covering all the different genres, right? Because, yeah. you know, you had you know, the standard superhero action adventure, right? And then you got into the 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 superhero comedy like Guardians of the Galaxy and Ant Man. And then you got into the rated R edgy, you know, superhero with Deadpool. Um and then now like Hellboy, you know, they they're 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 yeah. putting Hellboy and it's it's like a horror. It's like a horror superhero yeah. movie, which is I think is fascinating. And and, and Spawn too. Actually, Spawn is horror too. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And and it's actually much more in line with kind of the original, um, mm -hmm. you know, tone of the, of the books themselves. So I think it's really kind of interesting how it's uh, how the superhero, like I said, it kind of started out as its own genre and then has now suddenly, you know, blossomed so that it's really kind of, you know, all these little variants of it that okay. are that are all the you know, typical genres. All right. Well, I have another loaded question. I just thought of this one based on what you were saying. So, you know, we were saying that you're saying that DC is having a more cohesive universe. However, unlike Marvel, uh, DC doesn't seem to have a very uh, loyal cast. <laughs> yes. No, I got to say, Marvel is cleaning DC's clock. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, See, that's the, my issue. The, Where's the problem, The quality Jeff? of the movie. <laughs> what was that? What, what do you think the problem is where the, the actors are not loyal to DC, whereas the actors are loyal to Marvel? Because, I mean, you know, this kid, what was his name? Uh, the, the Chris Hemsworth and, and the other Chris that plays Captain America. I mean, they've been very loyal to the Marvel brand. Yeah. You know, that's, it's an interesting point. I would say, like, if you were thinking of them as, as like, say, football teams, you know, Marvel is going is the Patriots. They're going to the Super Bowl every year. Everybody wants to be in a Marvel movie. 
the DC, you know, movies have been struggling and, you know, they the like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, they're, you know, every once in a while they do something amazing. Wonder Woman I thought was incredible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I still haven't had a chance to see Aquaman yet, so I don't know how that one kind of turned out. But, you know, it feels like they're really struggling and I have no idea, you know, at the end of the day, these things are all its agents and contracts and and all these sorts of things and so i don't know those sort of dynamics but like i said i think it's a lot easier for a team for the patriots to keep players um you know coming back than uh you know a team that's 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 400 (laughs) you you said the patriots but are you a patriots fan please don't break my heart right now oh thank god oh my god are you kidding me no i (laughs) sorry i'm all right i would have ended the interview right now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> 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 no, no, no. I'm a long suffering Raiders fan. So oh, okay. So you know um, my pain. I'm a yeah. Giants fan, so <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Bobble stays we're home. The, we're the D C fans. <laughs> Why is Bobble quiet over there? You're not a Patriots fan. No, right? I'm listening. No, I I'm I'm a casual football guy at best. Like I my family's like obsessive with football. They're where I am a I'm a Colorado boy, so um uh, they're the Denver Broncos, so yeah. Oh, funny side story. When I was a kid, I asked my grandparents because they your whole basement's decked out in Bronco stuff. It's like the most unique basement I've ever seen. Like it's just painted orange and blue. And they watch the games religiously. They yell at the TV. They cuss. They get drunk and they just, they're all into it. I never have been. Okay. I think that's what turned me away from like, football like even when i played it in high school i was like this i was like i'd much rather wrestle like uh football's not that important <laughs> to me. like eh. it was like but anyways i asked him one time i was like here's the deal if i was on national tv and the denver broncos were playing which would you watch and they said the broncos and i was like how interesting i was like you guys are monsters <laughs> <laughs> all right so, all right, so- I, I'm gonna definitely ask you who your pick is before we end the show, but I want to get back to Legion M for a moment because obviously you also yep. had another big announcement where Jay and Son and Bob discussed the reboot and joining Legion M. Give us a little yes. bit about that. Come on, man, that's a big deal right there. Oh, it's a huge deal. So we're huge fans of Kevin Smith. Uh, we've worked with Kevin Smith now three times. He emceed our Stan Lee tribute. Mm-hmm. Um, he emceed the Stan Lee handprint ceremony that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and he also was the host of the Stan Lee pilot that we did in Stan Lee's you know, house um, in virtual reality for a project uh, that, uh, that we're developing. And so, um, you know, they're doing a reboot and it's, it's really funny because it's basically, it's not even a reboot. It's called Jay and Silent Bob reboot, but what it actually <laughs> is, is a sequel um, that is literally, it's making fun of sequels, reboots and remakes while okay. being all three at the same time. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, I'm really excited about it. Uh, Legion M is, as you know, we're a fan owned entertainment company. It's kind of like, um, you know, we've got probably 15,000 investors now, 10 or 15,000 investors that have all pooled their money. Um, and we turn around and we invest in projects. Uh, so is this sim- from, I'm sorry, but not to, oh, to cut you off there, but when you say that it's fan owned, is it similar to like a crowdfunding type of thing or are people investing into it? How is this? Well, how does, how does yeah, it work? So it, that's a great question. It is crowdfunding, but it's equity crowdfunding, which is a new thing. It only became possible about uh, two and a half Bye years so. ago when some laws changed. And that's frankly why we launched the company. And so when you think of crowdfunding, most people think of Kickstarter and Indiegogo, mm-hmm. uh, where you're effectively donating in exchange for maybe your name in the credits or a pre-order of the of the DVD or that sort of thing. Um, with equity crowdfunding, you are literally buying stock in the company. So the way that it works is people are buying stock in Legion M. They are shareholders. They're co-owners of the company, along with myself and Paul. And like I said, all 15,000 shareholders that we have right now. Um, it's kind of like the best analogy that I can use is it's like investing in Disney back when Disney was just Walt and Roy. 
If you could have bought stock in that company back at that time, it would be immensely valuable to them. Absolutely. And, um, <laughs> but you couldn't because it wasn't possible back then. And so uh, when the laws changed a couple of years ago, uh, we recognized that it created a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, because at the end of the day, an entertainment company should be owned by fans. Uh, an entertainment company owned by a large audience of fans has fundamental competitive advantages against every other entertainment company out there that's owned by Wall Street or corporate investors. Oh, you know, and this, this idea that when our movie comes out, so if you, you know, if you're one of the 15,000 people today that have invested in Legion M, or if you're one of the 50,000 people that are part of our community because you can join for free uh, and be a part of Legion M, even if you just, if you don't want to invest or if you're not sure about it, but if you're part of this community. You you know, you are now part of Jay and Silent Bob. And if you're an investor, you're an investor in Jay and Silent Bob. And so when that movie comes out, I mean, first of all, we're going to be following along as they develop it. We're working directly with Kevin to come up with cool ways to keep people in the loop and potentially even involve the Legion in some of the decisions as he develops the movie. But aside from that, when the movie comes out, you know, we're going to be there and our investors are going to come out to see it and they're going to bring their friends and family and they're going to be talking about it on social media. And so it, it, we have the capability to create the sort of grassroots buzz and enthusiasm that a studio would kill for, um, but money just can't buy. And so, um, you know, we believe that, like I said, the Jobs Act, uh, which was the legislation that changed the laws, created this once in a lifetime opportunity to, um, you know, create what we think could become one of the most influential companies in Hollywood. And, and, and so people know that, that, uh, That's that awesome. was the SEC pass. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, like I said, it's a startup. I mean, it's, 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 we're, we're right in the middle of it. Um, our, our, our long-term goal, if you look at our logo, it's an M with a bar over it, which is the Roman numeral for 1 million. Mm -hmm. And that's because our long-term goal is to unite 1 million fans as shareholders of the company. And, um, you know, right now, like I said, you don't have to invest to get involved. You can join for free and be a part of the community. And, you know, you don't have any equity in the company. So if we're successful, you're not going to make any money. But, uh, um, uh, but if you do decide to invest, the minimum investment is $100. Uh, the average is probably about 500 um, and we've got like people that have put hundreds of thousands of dollars in, but you know, most people are investing at the hundred or five hundred dollar level. But the point of it is, if we can achieve a million shareholders at five hundred dollars on average, that average holds. You're talking about five hundred million dollars to develop no movies and TV shows <laughs> that have you know a million people standing behind it when they come out, and that's that to us is the you know that's the North star for us. That's what we're chasing. Okay. We believe that could become one of the most influential companies in Hollywood. And so that's, that's what, uh, that's what we're swinging. For. That's amazing. You know, like, like Bobo had said, so, you know, that, that particular law, the title four of the jobs Act, you know, uh, for people uh, that don't know it, it allowed non-accredited investors to make investments in small businesses. Right. Yes. Bottom line. Yes. Do you want to elaborate yeah, a little bit on that? Uh, so, so people not yeah, in the sure, know in the sure. investment market. Yeah. So all, all that an accredited investor means that it's an SEC definition and it means that you have to have at least a million dollars in assets, not counting your home. Mm -hmm. So you, if you look at it, it's literally the wealthiest two or 3% of the uh, country because. of the population where the people that used to be allowed to invest in startup companies. And there was a very good reason for that. These laws were written back in the 1930s and the whole, they were consumer protection laws that were designed to protect small towns from carpetbaggers coming in, selling them on some crazy <laughs> investment scheme. You said carpetbaggers. I haven't heard that term in so long. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's, a, that's a textbook yeah, term. Exactly. From back that then. is. That is. That's like a history. That's like straight out of a social studies Mr. Book. Keys at <laughs> Social <laughs> Studies 126. My God. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But no, I mean, that was, that was a real thing. And so the SEC put these rules in place. And what they figured at the time was they said, if you are wealthy enough, I mean, A, it's easier for you to avoid, you know, to bear the loss if you get defrauded. But B, 
people that had wealth also had access to information that was not available to the regular to the regular man. Mm-hmm. And so in the 30s, these were probably very essential consumer protections. Um, but, you know, you flash forward to 2019 and we've got access to more information on our smartphone than J.D. Rockefeller had access to in his entire lifetime. And so, um, you know, why shouldn't you be able to invest $100 in a startup, you know, if it's something that you think is, uh, is, is worthwhile? And so uh, the SEC changed the laws, and um, it's still very regulated. Uh, we have to file audited financial statements. Uh, they have to do, you know, back, mm-hmm. go through background checks and um, make filings with the SEC and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's all not like a free for all. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, it's crazy the, the the paperwork sometimes. When I talk about rules without reason, <laughs> and I talk about the ones that you have to follow because there's no getting around it, I'm talking about some of these SEC rules, yeah. which are which are crazy. I mean, you, you know, you got to do them, but it's just it makes you want to tear your hair out sometimes yeah, because I, it's. it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> I did Wall right? Street early in the 90s. I, I, I worked. I was trying to get into that type of business, but unfortunately, um, I was led astray, <laughs> if you will. Have you oh. seen the movie <laughs> Boiler Room? That was basically yes. the life oh, I, I led for, for, for a whole year. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Wow. I kid you not. Uh, when I saw this movie, I'm like, oh, my God, this is exactly what I went through with these people doing drugs at the office and doing God knows what and selling illegal stock. And I don't know how I got yep. involved. And SEC cops uh, <laughs> raiding the offices. It was insane. I'm like, okay, no more for me. Let me go back into the safe world of technology. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yeah. No, I can imagine. And, and, and again, like the, the FCC, I mean, most of these rules, like they're all there for good reason. Yes, and, they are. and it's to protect people from that. It's to protect people from the boiler room and the wolf of Wall Street. Because, I mean, there are so many people out there that try and abuse things like this. And, you know, we, we do a lot of advertising. The way that we meet a lot of people is just on Facebook, right? It's just we've got a great community on Facebook and we've done – had success, um, you know, promoting Legion M that way. But at the end of the day, I mean, there's there's a million scams on the internet, and the 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 SEC or the police basically yeah. that you know do their best to try and keep people safe. But you know, the the problem is the SEC is a is a government bureaucracy, and a lot of times the rules that they are are enforcing are laws that are written by Congress people, and you know debates, you know, and partisan politics and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, yep. frankly, I, I think the people at the SEC are actually pretty, are, are very talented and hardworking and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of times they're given imperfect things that they have to, you know, their job is to implement the law. And when the law, you know, one of the biggest problems is a lot of the laws around securities don't contemplate the internet. Right. Yeah. They were written before the idea of a network of computers yes. even existed. Yes. And so, like, they just have these arcane rules that you mm-hmm. have to follow because it is the law and their job is to enforce that law. But if you asked anybody at the SEC, they'd say, yeah, this is a complete joke. But, you know, go talk to Congress and ask them to <laughs> fix it, because in the meantime, all I can do is implement it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um. I had a, I had a couple of questions that popped up that I didn't think I was going to ask, but I think they're good questions, if you'll indulge me. Um, the so you guys are the new kids on the block, in some senses. Yeah. Uh, you know, how has have you guys had a lot of pushback from like, you know, I, I don't want to turn the major studios into like these big evil characters but i mean you're bucking the system like you're doing something different they have their own way of doing stuff for so many years you guys are taking your own platform implementing things from there and doing your own thing at the same time has that been a challenge in terms of stuff like getting projects made distribution all that sort of stuff you know, it's a great question, and it's one that when we started the company, we did not know the answer to, right? That was one of the big risks. So if you had asked us a couple of years ago, like, how is this going to be received? And mm-hmm. what I would say is actually it's been received amazingly well. And oh, awesome. the reason is, yeah, it's, 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 the reason is, is like a Hollywood's kind of a weird place. I mean, actually, all, I think, industries <laughs> are probably more, more and more like this today, but... 
everybody in Hollywood is there are very few straight competitors in Hollywood. Right. I mean, I guess like Disney and Fox, you know, are essentially well, I mean, now they're going to be the same company. That's a bad example. Disney and Sony right, <laughs> are competitors. But at the same time, they're also potential partners. And so, like, I, I mean, I can't point to anything for a fact, but I'd be willing to bet that if you look, there's projects that Disney and Sony have collaborated on because there are thousands of companies in Hollywood and, you know, they're constantly realigning themselves and making partnerships and striking deals and all that sort of stuff. Like everybody, you know, just kind of works together. And so nobody like we're not really displacing anybody like i don't think disney's worried about us um mm -hmm. i think that if anything disney is maybe watching this going huh this is kind of interesting i wonder if there's something that we could do with these guys that would be worthwhile and um so as far as like the big companies that's kind of been uh the reception when it comes to actual talent and people um we, the reception has been amazing. I mean, the fact that, I mean, we're a two and a half year old company, right? We, Paul and I didn't come to town, be, you know, we're, we're not like Hollywood insiders that have grown up in the industry, you know, like we've had some entertainment experience with Moby mm -hmm. TV and we've got some good connections, but you know, it's not like we're, you know, growing up in, in, in the system. So, you know, we're basically newcomers. We've raised a total of like $5 million with Legion M. So it's not like, which in Hollywood is like nothing, <laughs> right? Like that's not, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's not enough money to do anything in Hollywood, but we've done movies with Anne Hathaway, Nicholas Cage. We've done a numerous projects with Stan Lee. We're in a Kevin Smith movie. Um, and what it is, is that, when we go to Stan Lee, Stan's a great example, um, because when we went to him, we were not coming to him as a corporate conglomerate saying, hey, we want to do a virtual reality series. Um, we want to film you, you know, in this ultra HD VR um, and do it. We want to do it in your living room. Um, we were literally going to stand saying we're a collection of your biggest fans mm -hmm. and we would like to do this project with you. And that opens up a lot of doors because if you look at the highest levels in Hollywood, the, the Stan Lee's and the Steven Spielberg's and JJ Abrams, yep. those people, they've got all the money that they need. They can do literally whatever they want yes, and they can. <laughs> everybody wants to work with them. <laughs> And so if you were in that position, who would you rather partner with? Just, you know, some, some rich oil tycoon or some big corporate conglomerate or literally 50,000 of your fans that have banded together um, mm -hmm. to try and do something. So we think that being a fan-owned company is actually uh, – that's another area where being fan-owned gives us a real edge in the industry. And let me ask you, because as you're talking about the building of Legion M and, you know, how you guys were the new jacks. That I, I see notes, you know, there's here, you know, currently backed by Seth, Seth Green and uh, Gaston Dominguez. How did you run into yep. those individuals and get and get them involved in the project? <laughs> oh, that's just all serendipity, I think, um, and networking. Uh, Paul gotcha. Scanlon, my co-founder, actually met Seth Green. He was vacationing someplace on a beach. <laughs> vacationing. And saw a chilling. guy. He was, <laughs> nice. Yeah, he was, he, he was like in a canoe on a beach with his wife, and he saw a guy over playing with action figures and a, and a cell phone camera <laughs> and went over to see what it was, and lo and behold, it was Seth Green. And that was uh, just was before it Robot Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> It was just before Robot Chicken launched, and so nice. uh, um, you know they were prototyping it and playing with it. And so uh, Gaston is a longtime friend of uh, David Baxter, who is our vice president of development. Um, and you know, so the two of them, when we founded the company, uh, there were four partners. It was Seth Green and the guys at Robot Chicken. It was uh -huh. Gaston um, at Meltdown. Um, it was um, uh, Susan Bonds and. Uh, at uh, 42 Entertainment, yeah. and um, I was Tim Lee at Alamo Draft House. And these were early people that we took the idea to before we had even founded the company wow. and asked them for advice, and they said, oh, my gosh, this sounds amazing. And we were like, well, hey, would you like to be a part of it? And, you know, and so <laughs> they were instrumental in the founding of the company. And, again, they're, they're, they're also – that was kind of the start of our – this amazing alliance of um, – advisors that we've got 
Um, and you can see it on our website, but you know, Leonard, there's, there's names, you know, like Leonard Bolton and, um, uh, and Tim League and Seth Green, but there's a lot of people that you probably don't know their name unless you're in the industry. You know, we've got senior executives from Sony and Netflix. We've got a guy that used to run distribution at a studio. Um, you know, we've got people that understand how the business works because at the end of the day, there's, there's two critical parts of Hollywood. One is the art of it. And that's the stuff that you and I can judge. And that's the stuff where we're having a legion of investors in our community okay. um, are a huge asset. We put a lot of stuff out for vote and we put a lot of stuff out. We've got a, we got 50,000 people out as movie scouts, you know, yeah. helping us navigate Sundance or helping us find the next big IP. And, and they're amazing for that. But the other side of Hollywood is the business side of it. And that part is really hard. It's really complicated. It's really nuanced. And, you know, Hollywood has a reputation of, you know, starry-eyed investors coming in with all their money and leaving with nothing. <laughs> because, gotcha. um, you know, there's a lot of sharks and it's a, it's a very complicated industry. So for us, you know, I like really, that word. we felt like we needed to have the balance. <laughs> I like the word usage. I like the word usage. A lot of people t- tell me it's a shady industry, but you just say it's complicated. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I like it's that. Very complicated. That is and, pretty and good. Which, which leads to the ability, you know, for people like real sharks out there that don't have, you know, to take exploit that and take advantage of that against I think people that, that, that word, don't understand what they're getting into. I think that your word usage is much more of an honest. <laughs> explanation yeah. of what it is to you know truthfully. Well, it, yeah i mean there's a lot of really good people in hollywood mm-hmm. you know but then i mean up until recently harvey weinstein was part of hollywood yep. and you know there's a lot of people that <laughs> for whatever Jeez. you know exploited people in all different avenues and all different ways and you know but it's but at the end of the day, I mean, I got to tell you, like, we've been, you know, we meet with a lot of people, and it's definitely more good than bad. <laughs> Excellent. And that's um, what you want to hear. That's good. That's yeah. good. That's what you want to hear. All right. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Now, uh, do you have any other questions, Bobo? Uh, ju- yeah, I just real quick, um, when we were when we were prepping for the show and whatnot, um, I saw that you guys, I looked at the projects that you guys were working on coming out with and whatnot. And I just, uh, I just wanted to run through them real quick with you, if that's okay. Of course. Um, the th- I only chose three. Um, uh, it was more on, uh, the New York <laughs> Rock Exchange. Um, mm-hmm. when I was digging into it, I also noticed that you actually, that was a previous, uh, avenue idea entrepreneurial thing that you had done previously if i'm not mistaken in the name at least came yes. from a yeah. previous endeavor yeah so the the it, it, i mentioned that moby tv that was the first company that i i, I co-founded with paul and mm-hmm. there was one other co-founder philip and that one started with the three of us working out of a spare room and grew into like it was hugely successful we had three or 400 employees. We had offices around the world. We won an Emmy. Um, and so um, in between that and Legion M, I had a company called Underground Labs, and we had a product called the New York Rock Exchange. And that that company did okay. I mean, it was in business for eight years, and, you know, we created jobs for eight years, and, but it, it never took off, and it never kind of, you know, got off the ground. And so, uh, um, but we were, we pitched and we've talked with partners about this show, uh, called New York Rock Exchange, which the best way to describe it is like a cross between Shark Tank and American Idol. Um, if you uh, can I imagine that, where I'm a where music fan, you, you are, just sold me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, the whole idea with New York Rock Exchange was, you know, you, you walk into some random bar, you hear some young singer there and you're like, oh my God, this, person is going to be a massive star like how do i buy a share of them and so gotcha. you know that was kind of the idea behind it and and um uh wait so when that, you say wait, what we've, wait, what when you picked. say that was the wait, wait you, that was the idea behind it but w- where exactly did you sit down and say this is where th- this is what's got to happen whether the idea initially pop up in your brain um 
uh, are you asking me when when did the idea come up, or or, yeah. or are you asking what, what, how did the what idea did come it? up and, and, and initially with, oh, for you to even think you know of what, that? To I happen. think it was honestly, I, I think it, it was it was watching American Idol. Um, I wasn't like an early fan of American Idol. I got involved with it. I was doing some stuff at Moby TV that was music related, and okay. so I'm like, oh, okay, well, I should probably watch the show because it's like the biggest show on television, okay. and. Lo and behold, I loved it. Uh, it was such a well-executed show. And um, what season you know, did you watch the, I, from the beginning? Oh, it was the season. No, no, no. It wasn't the first season. It was the season that um, with uh, David Archuleta, I think. And, Chuleta, um, boy, gotcha. Oh, David right. Cook. Oh, David Cook. Cook okay. won. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but but um, yeah. So I think it was probably season six or season seven. Yeah, it was around. But it was yeah. such a great show, and just this idea that like anybody you know all of us well not all of us i mean obviously <laughs> not all of us have good singing capability but hey, hey but, i could try um, sometimes you know <laughs> amongst us there are people that have amazing skills that have never had the opportunity uh to showcase them it, it's actually the same basis of one of our shows that we've done called pitch elevator um pitch elevator was oh, a full size that was you too we built on the floor of, of comic-con yeah and, um, you know, you could come up and, you know, you stepped inside the elevator and there was a cameraman and a countdown timer. And you had two minutes to pitch yes. your idea for a movie <laughs> or a TV show. I'm familiar and, with that. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the whole idea behind that was it's like any of us can have an amazing idea for a movie, but very few of us have the connections necessary to make that possible. So, you know, we created Pitch Elevator. We, we captured over 400 pitches from, you know, small children up to senior citizens from all over the world. And then we uh, used our community, uh, everybody in the Legion, to rate and evaluate them and, you know, basically democratically or meritocracy <laughs> uh, choose the uh, – choose the the top uh, the top ones and then those people get a chance to pitch their idea live to like agents and studio executives and the people that could literally make those ideas happen and one of them was um uh is going to be uh, uh added to the legion m slate so it's a it's a really cool idea kind of at its fundamental the new york rock exchange was doing that with music pitch elevator was doing that with uh, uh movies and tv shows Man, you should... very nice you should bring that to conventions. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we did it once, and we've been trying to do it more. Um, I recommend. Know, uh, we've had a lot of people very interested, and it's it's just it kind of comes down to a cost issue. It, it's uh, it's kind of expensive yeah. to transport a, a full size elevator all around the country <laughs> and go to conventions. And so, gotcha. um, but someday, I, I someday I think it's going to happen. Oh, someday I think we're oh, gonna be oh able you to could put thing. somebody in a fake elevator that doesn't move. Have have people outside moving it like it's going up and giving them two minutes. You could fake it, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I want to see this happen. Come on now. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh, wait, wait. So, um, oh, wait, Bob, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, the second one was the, what was it, uh, Comedy Royale? Yes. Oh, man. So yes. The idea behind Comedy Royale um, is very simple. It's that uh, if you were going to start a, a show like Saturday Night Live today um, and you wanted to go out and find these uh, emerging comics, they'd be on YouTube, right? They'd be creators. Like in the day yeah. and age that we live, like that's, there's so much amazing creativity um, on the internet. And so the idea was, was what if we went out and put out a call and said, anybody is allowed to submit uh, a sketch, you know, like you just like you'd see on Saturday Night Live. Anybody can submit it. And um, we used, uh, again, parts of the Legion, members of the Legion to help curate it that's going to rate and evaluate all of these different sketches until we end up with the top ones. Could the internet produce a show that is funnier than Saturday night live? I think that's really like the other working title would be like, literally it's Saturday night live versus the internet. So they've got some of the best writers in the whole world uh, that are all working together to kind of create something. It's like your paintball story from earlier. Gotcha. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we're, 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 our, our premise is, you know what? There's a, there's a 
billions of people with cell phones and creative ideas. And we think that if we could get out there and put a nice prize package behind it, that we could end up with a show that's, uh, uh, that's just as good. So that's, that's kind of what that pitch is about. I love gotcha. That. And then the, and then the last one was upside. Yeah. So upside is, is, uh, very similar to, um, I mean, the way to think of it, it's kind of like, um, the, uh, shark tank kind of meets the jobs act. Right. The idea that because of the Jobs Act, now you can do more than invest in, or, you know, vote on which company you think is going to be best. Like, you know, what if you could watch Shark Tank and then at the end of the show, you could literally jump in and invest alongside the sharks in this in this company that you're like, oh, my God, it's going to be um, amazing. It's, it, it's literally New York Rock Exchange and Upside are very similar. One of them is music focused. The other one is is more just um, kind of Shark Tank kind of small business entrepreneur focused. And can you make money on both if you invest in those particular ones? Well, so neither one of those exist yet. So so those okay. are what we, what you call development projects, which means that we are in development on them. We're going out. We're pitching them. So you know we'll meet with studios and networks and potential partners uh, like those three uh, shows in particular, we've been talking, we have a partnership with uh, chicken soup for the soul entertainment gotcha. and we've been working with them. Yeah. Nice. Kind of partnering with them. And so, you know, whether it's a web series that's going to be on um, a digital channel or a show that's on Netflix or something that's on broadcast TV. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of reskin this, but that's, that's that's what those are right like you know there's uh, if you look at our slate of projects there's um some big ones that are other people's projects that we've invested in like Anne Hathaway and Colossal and Nicolas Cage and Mandy and this new Kevin Smith movie that we've got coming out the other half of them are development projects so Girl with No Name Evermore um the, the those shows that you just mentioned are ones that we have internally ideas that we've come up with or we've partnered with and we're trying to get them made evermore uh, it's nevermore is it the new game man <laughs> yeah. right now, like, wait a minute Ooh. you guys <laughs> you guys got too much stuff going on this is fantastic though i love seeing that there's entrepreneurial spirit and trying to bring the best of fandom out there for everybody you that's know, the right. diversity of that's the what fan- it's all about yeah i love that it's, it's the diversity of the fandom that you're presenting it is it, amazing. Yeah. So thank you for that. It, it means a lot. I'm pretty sure it's a lot of different uh, uh, geekdoms, if you will. <laughs> well, I mean, at the end of the day, the whole idea behind Legion M is if you think about it, we, the fans, and it doesn't matter what fandom you're in, but we, the fans, are the ones that power the entire entertainment industry, right? We're the ones that pay for the tickets. We're the ones that decide what yeah. we're going to watch on a Tuesday night and pay the subscription. It's literally our eyeballs and wallets are what makes the whole industry go. And individually, any one of us is just a consumer. I'm a consumer. Um, But if we all band together, we have incredible power. And that's what Legion M is. It's about fans banding together to own a piece of the industry, to have a say in the development for our company and if our company is successful, and like we said, I mean, if it's successful, it could be really successful, we're participating in that success. Like, we're not voting on something that somebody else is going to make money on. We actually get to participate in it. And I think that that's, at its core, what Legion M is all about. And that sounds really fantastic. So I have- Yeah, you guys are, uh, you guys are cooking with a... Uh- Cooking with gas and cooking really good. I mean, I'm, I'm very impressed. Like, I'm, I'm being honest, not just because you're here uh, talking with us. Like, it, it's very exciting to see something like this just grow and, and continue to grow. Like, it, it's very cool. Listen, well, thank you very much. Yeah. As, as, see, as an entrepreneur myself and trying to build brands, uh, you know, and talking to you, uh, I've learned a lot right now. And I, I hope that in the future I'm able to pick your brain <laughs> uh, to move forward, man. You have this fantastic energy, and you have your button on the industry, which is great. And you have an enthusiasm <laughs> about it that, you know, you, we, we don't see too much. You know, we see too much drama, but you have a very positive 
uh, you know, enthusiasm to it, and that's definitely something uh, we we are feeling right now. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. I always enjoy the opportunity to talk to people, uh, people like you guys, about it. And um, yeah, like I said, I, we're we're thrilled, and it's uh, like I said at the beginning, it's a it's a it's a startup, which means it's a roller coaster ride, and. When it's amazing, things are amazing, and when it's when it's not, you're like, oh my god! But um, I feel, you know, uh, a lot of confidence that that we're gonna that we're we're on to something special here. I mean, we we talked are. with enough people. We you know we put this out there, and so uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, join the legion, baby. Absolutely, join <laughs> join the legion because Comic Crusaders is definitely going to join that legion for sure. And uh, before Excellent. we go, Jeff. Is there anything that you want to let people know, you know, whether on the entrepreneurial side or the fandom side, that, you know, you, you think is a nice little important piece of advice out there to put out? Oh, well, that's a great – well, there's two things I'll say. First of all, join the Legion. It's free. Go to <laughs> legionm.com and be a part of what we're doing. Uh, as far as from an advice standpoint, um, I mean, I would just throw out there, I think that the key to success is learning how to fail. And I feel like um, that's one thing that as an entrepreneur, you have to get really good at. And you just have to recognize that when you put yourself out there, you know, whether it's starting a company or writing a script um, or doing something, you know, that takes you out of your comfort zone, you know, meeting a woman and falling in love, you know, it, it's, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to learn how to fail. And I feel like the biggest thing that holds us back as individuals is the fear of like, Oh, what if I'm making a mistake? What, what if I'm making a, a mistake? You know, what if, what if this is the wrong move? And I think that the difference between, you know, entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs is recognizing that, yeah, you know, it probably is a mistake, but, you know, moving, not moving forward is not an option. You, what you, you got to learn how you can move forward, how you can learn as quickly as you can, whether this is a mistake or not a mistake, um, and then evolve from there. And you double down on the stuff that works and the stuff that's a mistake, you just cut it loose and that's, that's how you, uh, that's how you move forward. There we go, man. See, beautiful words right there, folks. You better listen to that. <laughs> that's some, that's some real stuff right there. Honestly, it really is. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about that failure stuff and learning how to work through that and continuing to proceed. And I've had my incidents in life where I've been taken down, but I've refused to fall and I stand up and it is what that's it is. That's right. Knows. We got to keep yeah, moving absolutely. forward, folks. But we're here to that's win. That's right. All right. Yeah, so, that's right. It's not how you fall. It's how you get up. So absolutely. I, I think that's beautiful. Be well said. Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy few weeks to chat with us today. <laughs> and uh, Bobo, you too. I know you've been busy doing all those Crisis on the Toyverse videos that everybody's been loving <laughs> this week. So keep up the great job, folks. Thank you for listening to Undercover Capes Podcast Network. I'm Al Mega. Very happy to be back. Thank you guys for your support. Talk to you soon. Bye. This is an Undercover Capes production. Thank you for listening. Make sure to visit ComicCrusaders.com, UndercoverCapes.com, GeekViewMagazine.com, and our newest venture, SplintedPress.com.